to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we've done a lot of background on grace for a while. And we're getting ready to, we're going to bail off. Feet first, head first. <laughs> we're going to get covered in the blood, so y'all get ready. But we're going to open up with some scripture first. Before I even talk about the introduction. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 6, y'all know this verse, or this portion. It says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender root, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form, nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Know who we're talking about there, right? Talk about Jesus. Sharon Hill's favorite verse is right there. By his stripes we are healed. And that's the truth. So as you can tell, we're going to be talking about salvation grace. Chain bacon grace. Freedom grace. A grace that can't be bought. Sold. It's just given and received. It can't rot. It can't de be decomposed. It can't decay. It can't be stolen. It can't be lost. Because God says it's so. That grace is what makes us. See, there's all, we talk about this. There's all, the Bible is full of grace, of different means and measures and varieties and everything else. But this is the grace that hits us right between the eyes, right? Think about it. That salvation grace. So we're going to turn to John chapter 3. Funny Bert, funny that I picked that one, huh? But we're going to start in John chapter 3 in verse 9 and go through verse 18. Because we need to understand what he's leading up to. Because I, I see our world in this, these verses before we get to 16. In John chapter, we're going to read three, uh, chapter 3, 9 through 18, all the way through, then I'm going to come back and we're going to break it down. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak that we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly to things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, 
because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Woo! If that don't get you fired up, your wood's wet. It's cold and wet outside, but it's, it's warm and toasty. I want to tell you, you know, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He calls him teacher with a small t, right? See, Nicodemus was a, a master teacher of Israel, an expert on the law, the writings of the prophets, all that. He knew him front and back. He was good. He studied. But, always a but there, he didn't recognize the teaching on spiritual cleansing and transformation based on Scripture. Right back to Isaiah, right? In its, <clears throat> in its uh, showing that the externals of relig religion, the religious doctrines, have a deadening effect on one's spiritual perception. Doesn't matter if you're sprinkled, dipped, or dunked, right? A lot of people can't fathom that. Doesn't matter if you sing four hymns or three hymns, does it? People let the things get in the way of the truth that believe. <laughs> and he, then he goes on to tell Nicodemus again, you do not receive our witness. You. And that's a plural. He's referring to Nicodemus as the representative of the whole nation of Israel. And indicating the unbelief that was typical of the whole nation. But think about it when he says, you do not receive our witness. That's the capital of the three. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. All of them have been at work since before Genesis 1 was even thought of, right? They were all there in the creation. They are all there pointing they're all there guiding, and they don't see it. In John chapter 8, verses 13 through 19. John chapter 8, verses 13 through 19. Make sure I've got that. It says, The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself, but your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And yet I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. See, once again, they just can't fathom it. whole new lifestyle. Then he talks about earthly things and heavenly things. <laughs> Whatever miracle he performed, or whatever he said, they didn't believe him, right? They were always finding something wrong. There's no way. They called him, well, he's casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. Calling him the devil, right? Little did they know. And it tells about that in Revelation 1 7. Revel chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 7 says. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth were mourn because of him, even so, amen. Every eye. You know, that's not just talking about living eyes, right? That's talking about every eye that was ever created that walked this earth. It makes you wonder. What's going on in our, in our, just our country today, not talking about the uh, world, just in our country today, 
how many eyes are focused on the Lord than sitting at home, wringing our hands, oh, I wonder how much more gas is going to go up. I wonder what the president's going to do this time. It doesn't matter who's in control. God is. He's the one that allowed it. We just have to have that blind faith that he's going to handle it. And then he says, no one has ascended to heaven. Hmm. See, this verse contradicts other religious claims to have special revelation from God. We're the chosen ones. Only God talks to us. Kind of sounds like the Pharisees, right? We're Abraham's children. That's on a lot. I'm going... I'm going, to, I'm going to heaven because my father was Abraham 350 years ago, right? No, don't work that way. Don't work that way. But the truth is that Jesus states is that no one but him has ascended to heaven and, and such as to return and talk about heavenly things. Only he had permanent residence in heaven prior to his incarnation. And therefore, only he has the true knowledge regarding heavenly things. I want you to think about something. How many have lived in their house more than 20 years? Okay. You know your house inside and out, right? You know when something's out of place and when it's not. You know what's going to happen when you flip this light switch on, that light switch on. Jesus knows heaven backwards and forwards, right? That was his home until he came to reside on earth for who? Us. So the Pharisees are telling him, you don't know anything about what's going on up there. Really? Been living there before I built the earth, buddy. You know, but it's that mind state that you can't, they can't fathom. Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. I'll get there. And it says, Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who Established all the ends of the earth. What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? Whoo! Puts it pretty bold, I believe. <laughs> it takes me out of the equation real quick, doesn't it? You know, it goes to, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. <laughs> we all know... Uh, that's what Moses had to do, build a serpent for the Israelites to be healed because there were serpents running around, these snakes running around. They'd get bit. Why? Because of their unbelief and grumbling and mumbling. So God sent the snakes. Moses had to build a brass, bronze snake. And any time you got bit, you had to look up on the snake and you'd be healed, right? Hmm. So that's the veiled prediction of Jesus' death on the cross. The point is the snake lifted up, it healed physically. It didn't heal spiritually. But those who look to Christ will live spiritually and eternally. Think about that. What's better? Living life whole or eternal? Think about it. We're going to get to more of that in a second. And then he talks about eternal life. The same Greek word is translated as everlasting life. And these two terms appear in the New Testament nearly 50 times. So they're pretty doggone important. For a believer, they're very important, right? That's what we're banking on. That's our guarantee. But I want you to think about this. Eternal life refers not only to eternal quantity, but divine quantity. This life, is for, this life for believers 
is experienced before heaven is reached. Think about that. We are living heaven on earth at this moment. But we don't act. Woe is me. I got to pay $3.09 a gallon. Oh, that way. We let the external get in the way of the internal. If you allow the internal to bloom, to trust, to have faith, guess what? The external is going to follow suit, isn't it? You know, the one good thing about, not the one good thing, a benefit of being a Christian is living heaven on earth, having that internal freedom and external freedom, right? The only thing an unbeliever has is external freedom, right? There's no internal freedom. No chains are broken. If we could look at uh, a mansion right up here on the hill, and there's a rich man, looks good, got his three-piece suit, fancy cars, got folks mowing his grass for him, clipping his hedges, got a maid, two, whatever, but he doesn't know the Lord. Inside, you'd see a broken, crippled, poor man. The outside looks good. But the inside is where it counts, right? See, we as people a lot of times put too much emphasis on what the external looks like. It's right here. It doesn't matter if you like what I look like. What matters is I love you because you're my brother and my sister in Jesus Christ. You know, we say we, we need to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like, one of the qualifications is, is to look at a lost person and love them and pray for them. But then we get, get even farther. This in, the eternal life is in essence nothing less than participation in the eternal life of the living Word, Jesus Christ. You know, whoo, how, how much more proof does a person have? We've got the very Spirit of God residing within. And Jesus says, you can live for me. He'll make it possible. You know, in eternal life, it's the life of God in every believer. But it's not yet fully manifest until the resurrection. Think about that. None of this is fully going to manifest itself completely until Jesus takes us home. Whether He comes next second, after we've been buried for 20 years, whatever it may be. But it becomes manifest then. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, it tells us a little more. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. And Paul says right there in verse 20, He eagerly awaits. Yeah. That needs to be what we need to be doing. Eagerly awaiting. But are we supposed to just sit on our hands, sit in our chair, just while we're waiting? We've got work to do. We got things to do. If we are children of God, which the Bible tells us, we're supposed to be His hands and feet. In verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
that first part of that verse, it says, For God so loves the world. The Son's mission is bound up in the supreme love of God for this evil, sinful world of humanity that's in rebellion against God. Think about that. It's not hard to see evil in our world. Now, you can turn on the news in the morning, the evening, midday, whatever. You don't see much love in anything else going on, right? But he said, even so, I'll do it. I'll do it. And that word intensifies the greatness of his love that the Father would give his unique and beloved Son to pay the price for sinful man. Hope y'all weren't counting on me giving you one of mine. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> y'all damned hell, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And you're waiting on me to send one of my children for you. <laughs> but God said, I'll do it. And guess what? Jesus had to say, I'll do it too, right? In John chapter 1, verses 6 through 13. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Ooh. Says it all over again, right? But he says, every man in verse 9. It's kind of like what Paul says throughout. When it says all, it means all. Everyone has a chance. Everyone. See, he does that in so many different ways, in so many different places in Scripture, from the front to back. You're not going to be able to stand there before him and say, well, I didn't know. Can't sue me. I didn't know. <laughs> Sorry, you just bought the farm. And then it says, whoever believes in him. Who? Whoever. Whoever. Anyone. It doesn't matter. Race, creed, color, religion, status, wealth, crippled, whole. But all who will believe. And I'm not talking about Santa Claus belief. I'm talking about a true belief. A faith. Note that it says all who believe. The only thing we have to do that's required of us is to believe. See, God makes 999 steps to each and every one. But he won't make that last step. You have to take it to believe up to you and for the life of me I can't understand why folks don't but looking back at my life I could understand them because I was too full of myself you know thought the whole time man you fall in for that you got to give up all the fun stuff <laughs> man there ain't no way I want to do any of that shoot oh what a big lie that you sw we swallow there but you know that faith of belief. I want to ask you something. I'm going to jump ahead. I'll repeat some of this in a minute. But a lot of people don't believe that. Just believe. Truly believe. That belief of faith. i got to go to church. you got to do this. you got to know your Bible. Put some of those statements to rest. You know, I know a guy that can recite the Bible front and back. Pick a scripture out of the air for any, anything you want. He is a theologian, theologian that word, knows the Bible. <laughs> Backwards and forwards. 
But you know what? He's lost his goose. Never had a personal relationship. He can give you anything to fit whatever circumstance you're in, but he can't apply it in his life because he doesn't believe that he needs a personal relationship. He just believes an intellectual knowledge. Doesn't work. Back to some of those other things that trying to say we've got to do all these good works. Well, I believe there's a thief on the cross that's uh, in paradise right now that uh, he didn't get sprinkled, dipped, or dunked. I bet you he never tithed. Never sang a hymn. Never graced a church door. But guess what? He truly believed. And what did Jesus do? He guaranteed him. You'll see me in paradise tonight, buddy. Don't get me wrong. If we have time on this earth that God gives us the breath to, He's going to give us a desire to do things. Not, not taking that away. But the main thing to get started with is believe. The rest comes as we grow, right? In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, <clears throat> John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it tells us. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Right there. This book was written... Brother Jim calls it God's love letter to us, which is true. It's to draw us, to convict us, to bring us to Jesus Christ, whatever the circumstance may be. And then he talks about, you shall not perish. That's the promise. Just like we're talking about the thief on the cross had no time for repentance or anything. Think about it. You know, uh, we had a lady in Sunday school years and years ago that said it, a guy was arguing with her. He said, you know, you've got to repent from your sins. He said, well, wait a minute. What if I'm over here on the tracks right here on 40, 405, got my earphones on, listen to my music, and a train is coming, and I look up at the last second and say some filthy words. You're saying I won't be forgiven? Those sins are forgiven and gone. It don't, it don't add up no more. Once, And we're going to get in that more. Once you are saved, you are truly saved. We're going to fall off the wagon. But we've got to get back on the horse. That does not, the only thing it does, it breaks our relationship. It doesn't break the fact that we're saved. But it breaks the relationship. And most of the time, I don't know about you, but your Holy Spirit will start tweaking on you. And you will come to that point that I need to get right again. So, uh, just like the thief on the cross, he, he didn't have time. He believed and was heaven bound. And see, God made it so simple, right? Believe. Truly believe. But once again, we make fun of the Pharisees, but it happens right here today. We put restrictions on. Well, you know, that's good, God, but we need to add a little something. You need to come to Sunday school, brother. You need to get to church more often and start putting guilt trips on, folks. It's not what it's about. Yes, we need to come to church and Sunday school. But we're not to lay those guilt trips on people. In 2 Corinthians 5.21... 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There it is right there. No matter what I do, what you do, where we fall off the wagon, when we come to that true belief and we're truly saved, 
that righteousness never leaves. Kind of like, like I like to say, you know, it's, uh, they make all these new pots and pans, they're Teflon coated and all this, fried egg, milk, candy, you name it, cheese, nothing sticks. That's the way sin is to us. I'm Teflon coated. <laughs> Slap it on me and it run right off. God don't see it no more. <laughs> but that's true. It's true. But you know, Unlike these Teflon pans that last maybe six months and they wear out and everything sticks, y'all got some of them like me. God's Teflon don't wear out. It's eternal. It's eternal. And then we get... Let me get to where I was at again. Check the time. Oh, we're going to barely have enough time. Verse... Uh, <clears throat> In verse 17, it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. In Luke 15.10. Luke 15.10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Think about that. One sinner who repents. Jesus and the angels are rejoicing. God's smiling. They're partying. Think about it. Why do Jesus and His angels rejoice over one repenting sinner? Can they see something we can't? Do they know something we don't? Absolutely. They know what heaven holds. Heaven is populated by those who let God change them. Change them. Our arguments cease, for jealousy won't exist. Suspicions won't surface, for there will be no secrets. Every sin is gone. Every insecurity is forgotten. Every fear is past. No wonder the angels rejoice. They know another work of God Another work of art will soon grace the gallery of God. They know what heaven holds. That's us. That's us. That's how we should be living today in this world. Think, go back to Psalms 23. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. It doesn't say, if I walk through the valley of shadow of death. When? It says, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death right now, each and every one of them, and I fear no evil. We are victorious conquerors by the blood of Jesus Christ. And He tells us that. We have, run, we have run, won access to the throne room. When God tore that veil, when we became saved, I can go sit in my daddy's lap in the throne. Every time I pray... I am transported. My, my spirit is transported to heaven faster than 911. He knows what, I, what I've got to say. Now guess what? Sometimes I don't say the right things. He said, you didn't want to say that. I used to think, you know, there's an angel up there waiting. He's got a tennis racket. Oh, that's not a good prayer. You have to send it back. But he hears it. And guess what? Just like any father, he's patient. Because face it, as we all have raised children and we're children ourselves, as your kids learn to walk and talk, there's a two year olds are hard to understand, right? You have to huh, huh, huh. Well, God doesn't have to huh us, but He has to prompt us a little bit. Same way when, you, when you're walking, when that little child first starts getting up, holding on the coffee table, wiggling and getting us down and all that. And starts making those few steps across the living room. And thank goodness for diaper butts. <laughs> we, we're up there. We're getting them. We're coasting along. That's how patient God was, is with us. That's how much He loves us. And Jesus the same way. Think about what Jesus prayed as He was hanging on the cross. Forgive them, Father. Think about that. When he had every right to say, damn them all to hell. Thank you, Mike. Okay. 
Now we're going to go to, on the same thing, go to Romans 8, 1 through 4. <clears throat> Romans 8, 1 through 4. If I can get there. Romans 8, 1 through 4. Y'all know this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, there's some believers that are plagued by feelings of condemnation. They either think they will not live up to God's expectations, or they're drowning in guilt over past sins. These folks can't seem to shake the sense that God is displeased with their puny efforts to be Christ-like. Roman, Romans confer, confronts this lie head on. There is no underlying N-O condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When Christ Jesus went to the cross... He lifted the blame from our shoulders and made us righteous before God. Why? Because we believe. It's that simple. Because we believe. He took all, all that sin. Brother Jim's brother John, years ago when we were preaching at the tent revival, said, you know, it really got to him and it broke my heart when he gave this analogy. He said, Jesus Christ took that cup with all my sins. And he looked in it and saw my sins and said, I'll do it even for you. Think about that. For every person in this room, because I can't fathom every person in this world, much less Riverside, just bring it down to this room or half this room. I couldn't understand then. But he said, I love you that much. You can't pay the price, but I can You know, feelings of condemnation don't belong to us. They're from Satan. He amplifies our guilt and feelings of inadequacy, inadequacy and then suggests that that's how the Lord feels about His wayward children. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our sins are wiped clean and we are chosen and loved by God. Condemnation is reserved for those who reject God. That's it. That's it. And it tells us that in John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Don't believe anything I say. It says right here. Because I, I say, I can't give you nothing but a lot of hot air. But God can, can give you the reality. But isn't that the truth? You know, we'll be bebopping along here doing fine, and all of a sudden we get that feeling, oh my God. You remember what I did back then? Or yesterday, or even today. And boy, that, it's kind of like that butter commercial we used to have, the little red devil and the white angel. That devil starts overpowering that angel. You start believing what he says. Well, maybe that is how God feels about me. That's farther from the truth you'd ever be. That's just Satan. He can't get us. He can't steal us. He can't kill us unless God allows him to kill us. But he can sure put a lot of insecurity and doubt in our life. And that's all he wants to do is muddy the waters. You know, hey, once you're, and we're going to get in this next week, once you are His, He tells us He's in 
you're in the palm of his hand right there. And ain't nothing. Ajax can't take it out. It, it, ain't, it ain't going nowhere. But you know, and we know that sin is a death sentence. Romans 6.23 tells us that. And anyone choosing to cling to sin instead of de seeking divine forgiveness must pay the penalty which is eternally, eternal separation for God. See, when each and every one of us came to know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that's why we, we came to Him. We knew we had that guilt of sin. I can't do anything. You might have been young, you might have been old. It doesn't matter. As long as it matters that you came. God's patient. But those that don't want to, that are self-centered, that say, hey, look, look at all my fine whatever, my bank account's full. I have no needs, no wants. <laughs> I don't need that stuff. I sleep late on Sundays. I don't need, I don't need to open a Bible. I've, I've got YouTube. Whatever. They, don't understand, they won't understand. But it also tells us in there that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And I, I just have a mental picture of that. When it says every knee shall bow and tongue confess, that's going to be every person that was ever graced this world. And I just got visions of God's angels, of us, kneeling in submission, humility, joy, and gladness. I can see the angels walking through the lines, and some of them said, you ain't making me stand. He's going to put his hand on his shoulder and say, get down on your knees, you dog. And that's it. But it's too late then. It's too late. You know... The believer's penalty for sin is paid. And I can stand blameless in front of God. Think about that. If we got... We all had a mass heart attack. We all went to heaven right now. We could all stand in front of God blameless. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't, it ain't going to happen. But it's... You trust in the Lord's love and let go of Satan's lie. Think about that. Because a lot of times that lie is loud and noisy and gets your attention. And God's love a lot of times is quiet, still, small voice, right? It's kind of like trying to listen to an uh, opera in a rock concert. Don't work. One's going to drown out the other unless you're focused on hearing His love and His grace and His forgiveness. God's children are covered by His grace and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then in verse, verse 18, it says, He who believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe, is, we've read that, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Ooh, I'm going to run. We'll close with this. Believe in him. This phrase means more than just an intellectual knowledge to the claims of the gospel. It includes trust and commitment to Christ the Lord <clears throat> which results in a new nature. So you're looking at a new man, and I'm looking at a lot of new men and women out there. Because the old man wasn't, wasn't nothing to look at, I can promise you. But by God's salvation, the new man is born. And a lot of times, I got as just being folks. A lot of times we like to go back and try to put on our old clothes, don't we? That's okay. God's patient. And He's forgiving. And He takes care of it. That new man 
results in a new nature. Doesn't happen overnight. Happens over time, right? You know, it's each and every one of us are still a work in progress. Just like Royal's Chapel had that cap made years ago. Work in progress. We're made complete in Jesus Christ, but we don't have the knowledge yet. We keep learning and growing. And just like when you're in school, when you go take a test, sometimes you fail and have to retake the test. That's okay, because God's patient. He's still working. And when he talks about that trust, we're to trust him. The only way you can trust him is have that personal relationship. Because face it, you can't trust somebody you don't know, can you? You don't trust somebody you don't know. So I ask you tonight, first off, do you know him? If you don't, tonight's the night you can change. Second off, do you trust him? Because, you know, I can tell you, when I, when I came to know him, I didn't trust him at first. It took a while. It took some growing. It took some hard knocks to get attention. But you've got to come to that trust where he'll be evident and manifest your life. Because we have, we have a lot of Christ, Christian folks out there in the world right now that they can talk a good story, but they've got a bushel basket over the light of Jesus Christ. You know, is Jesus the Lord of your life seven days a week, 24-7? Or is He just the Lord of your life on Sundays and Wednesdays? Question not only you can answer. I'm going to close that because we're going to... I done ran over. Let's close the prayer. Father God, I just thank you for this night, Father. I thank you for the words, and Father, I thank you for opening my eyes to let me trust you even more, Father. Just I pray that we'll just put all our faith in you, Father. And I pray if there's one tonight that doesn't know you, Father, that tonight will be the night of salvation, Father, that the angels would, would rejoice in heaven again tonight, Father. Lord, and I just thank you for your love and the message that you give to us, Father, that, uh, Lord, you didn't stop at anything to... Come to us, Father. And just pray as we leave here tonight that you just bless us and uh, just open our eyes to you and everything around us, Father. And let us show your love to somebody that we don't know. and just, They can just see your light shining through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.